Good morning, everyone. Let's open in our Bibles to the book of Galatians this morning, chapter 6 of Galatians. And I want to continue something I started last week. I didn't really expect that to become a long, drawn-out series, but I have some more things I want to talk about. Really, I'm basically taking a look at John Hagee's book entitled Jerusalem Countdown. And again, the reason I've decided to do this is simply because of the current events that are taking place here in America, and especially as it pertains to the Middle East and the possible war with Iran. We're already embroiled in a conflict in Iraq, as you all know, and there's a lot of talk about perhaps now a war with Iran. And my concern has been there's a big portion of the Christian community, evangelical Christian community, are urging the U.S. to go into war against Iran. And they're doing it from a biblical basis, what they consider a fulfillment of prophecy. And as I said to you last week, I find this sort of thinking quite dangerous. And so what I want to do is take a look at this and the book that Hagee wrote called Jerusalem Count. I have a copy of it. I've been going through it this week. And I want to show you some areas where I think that they're off and why I think they're off. And hopefully this will make some sense to us. But here, let me use this as our foundation text. This particular passage at the very end of the book of Galatians, uh, Paul is kind of summing up some things. He's writing here sort of a postscript. Uh, and down in verse 14, he says this, But may it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The one thing you always see in Paul's writing always comes back to Christ and he always comes back to the cross. It doesn't matter. He's always coming back. His focus in the New Testament is always on Christ and the cross. Always. And then he goes on to say, For neither is circumcision anything, he says, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Now, notice how he uses the term Israel of God. He uses the term Israel not in the term, not in the sense that people typically think of when they think of the term Israel. Typically, they think about a physical land, a geographical location, a nation in the land of Palestine or in the Middle East. Pretty much what we're seeing in this book here, Jerusalem Countdown, is that whenever you see the word Israel, for the most part in the New Testament, it's always referring to, to Israel, the nation. Well, Paul here, the apostle, shows us that when he views Israel, when he uses the term, he's referring to the new creation. Does everybody see how he synonymously, how easily he moves from, from the new creation to the Israel of God? Everybody see that? It's just a, an easy flow for him. There in verse 15. Uncircumcision doesn't mean anything. Uncircumcision. That doesn't mean anything. The only thing that means anything is the new creation. And then he says, and those will walk by this rule. What is that rule? That the cross of Christ is the focal point of their life. Okay? Christ and his cross. Those who walk by that rule. He says, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. That's God's Israel today. God's Israel today is the new creation. And the new creation consists of all those who have faith in Christ and look only to his atoning work on the cross for their acceptance before God. Not their circumcision, not their genealogy, nothing that they can point to in the flesh, only faith in Christ and complete trust in his righteousness that has been imputed to them. Now, with that in mind, I want to take a look at some things in the book here. Uh, and what I've done is, and I must admit to you, it was, uh, and I say this kind of, I don't know how I want to say this, but it's very difficult reading this book for me. It's very difficult because the one thing I have found as I went through it was that Hagee pretty much dismisses anybody who doesn't see his way uh, as, he uses several terms, he uses them as demagogues, anti-Semitic, narcissistic. I mean, he uses, he uses what you would consider terms that are offensive. Anybody who disagrees with his view. And particularly, it's disturbing because Christians are always been called to is to rally around the truth. Jesus and I in the way, the truth, and the life. And within the Christian community, there's always been differing views on eschatology. But one thing I find is pretty amazing to me is that because somebody doesn't agree that dispensational theology is the truth and they happen to differ with it, and they differ uh, with this view because of scriptural reasons to, to, to dismiss them as anti-Semitic or as demagogues or as narcissistic, it crosses over the line in my opinion. 
And it serves no useful purpose. All it does is alienate them. It just causes harshness and hostility between them rather than trying to get people to listen to what somebody has to say. I can say this, and I still have this tendency even now. When I'm combating what I consider error and I'm trying to defend the truth, I can be caustic at times. And I've noticed that in my earlier days particularly, pretty dismissive of those who didn't agree with it. Well, as you get a little older, you tend to have a little bit more self-restraint and more consideration for others, even though you may think they're wrong. You try to refrain from personal attacks on them. You don't impugn their motives. Now, I don't impugn Johnny Hagee's motive or anybody who agrees with this view of theology. I just think it's radically wrong. But I don't say they're not sincere. They're very sincere. They're quite sincere in what they believe, and they're quite committed to it, and they're acting according to their belief. I can't fault them for that. I just have problems with the view. And I don't think it's anti-Semitic or demagoguery to refute it or attempt to say, hey, this isn't true, and to show why it's not true. So the kind of attacks that he uses on those who don't agree with him in his book serve no useful function. They all just alienate people. Now, with that said, what I want to do is I'm going to go through bits and pieces of this book, and I've got all kinds of things marked out here and whatever. But let me show you some of the things he mentions and just to start off and give you some of the problems that I have and why, when you go through the book, you find it so difficult to accept so many things that are said in here. When you read this, the first thing that he comes out with, and this is on page 174, so I'm going to document everything I'm saying here. He makes this statement. Let me just define this to you to show you something here. He uses the title called Propagation versus Revelation. And I'm going to read right out of this book. It's on page 174, so anybody who's hearing this by tape or CD, they can follow along with it. So I'm not adding to his words. I'm not taking away from his words. I'm just reading what he's written. And he says, let's define propagation and revelation. Propagation defines the messenger who proclaims a message as in a pastor or evangelist proclaiming the gospel. Revelation is the supernatural removal of a barrier to see what was not known. The book of Revelation is the removing of a veil so that the eyes of John could see the future of the church. Gentiles come to Christ by the propagation of the gospel. I have preached in auditoriums, churches, cathedrals, football stadiums, and to a massive audience in Nigeria of more than 3 million in the open air. When you preach the gospel to Gentiles, it is common and hundreds and often thousands respond to the invitation to receive Christ. This is the power of the gospel and the message of proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is not true of the Jewish people who have been judicially blinded to the identity of Messiah. This is confirmed by David, whom St. Paul quotes in Romans 11.10, let their eyes be darkened so they do not see. The more accurate translation of this verse is let them be judicially blinded so they may not see. So how do Jewish people from the time of Christ until today come to recognize the true identity of Christ? The answer is that those who recognize Christ as Messiah do so through divine revelation, as did the twelve disciples who followed Christ and the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. Now do you understand what what he's saying here? He's saying that the Jews come to a knowledge of Christ in a different manner than the Gentiles. That's his claim. Okay? Now, he says, as proof of this, he says, let's go back to Matthew 13, where Jesus is teaching the Jewish people in parables. The disciples asked Christ why he was teaching the Jewish people in parables. Christ answered, because it has been given to you, the disciples, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And he puts the word revelation, but to them it has not been given. So his his inference from that, the point is made very clear that Jewish people who come to recognize Jesus as Messiah do so by the process of divine revelation from God. That's assumed. I don't read that when I read that text. He just assumes that. Now, but let's let's go on. However, it is imperative that all spiritual truth be established by two or more witnesses within the word of God. So in other words, he makes his claim and now he says, I'm going to find show you another witness to confirm this. Scripture should always be interpreted by Scripture that the divine truth does not become corrupted by carnal knowledge or by personal bias. Mm -hmm. The spiritual principle is that Jewish people today come to recognize Jesus Christ via revelation. Is there another witness other than Jesus Christ in Matthew 13? Yes, the conversion of St. Paul in Acts chapter 9. And it says, his name is Saul. As the drama of Acts 9 opened, he was born in the city of Tarsus, as confirmed by Acts 22.3. His birth occurred between A.D. 1 and A.D. 5. 
Stolov grew up in a Greek culture, maintained loyal, excuse me, remained loyal to his Jewish roots all his life. His family was wealthy and socially influential, and they had the power as Jews to obtain Roman citizenship. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees who received his education from the renowned teacher Gamaliel, again, quotes Acts. Some theologians believe that at one time Saul must have been married since marriage was required by the Pharisees to reach levels of promotion. And he says, as the drama of Act 9 opens, Saul has a vicious attack. Saul launched a vicious attack on the followers of Christ, having them thrown into prison to be beaten and murdered. As he comes near the gates of the city of Damascus, suddenly a bright light shone around him from heaven. Saul had a dramatic face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus Christ, the light of the world. He was totally blinded physically by the experience for three days and was led by the hand, like a child, to the house of Ananias, who lived on the street called Straight. Ananias laid his hands on Saul, prayed this prayer, examined it closely. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight, and he puts the word physical sight, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he goes, now listen to this. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, the judicial blinding of God, spiritually had ended, and he received his sight at once. Paul is yet another witness to the fact that Jewish people recognize Jesus the Messiah via revelation from God. Now this is what's, what's kind of scary. Here's, here's, his, here's where he goes. Just as Paul received the revelation of Christ as Messiah in Acts 9, there will be 144 witnesses, Jewish witnesses, in the tribulation who have a similar experience with 12,000 Jews from each tribe protected by the hand of God with a seal on their forehead. They shall come to the earth bearing witness to their fellow Jews that they have had a supernatural visitation and now recognize Christ as Messiah. Now, that is pure conjecture on his part. Now, the way he states this is that, well, this is now proven. I've proven to you because I've given you two witnesses, Matthew chapter 13 and, of course, Paul's conversion saying that all Jews receive the knowledge of Christ through revelation, and therefore I've proven this beyond equivocation, and this is the way things are going to happen. And that, in, in essence, then, 144 Jewish witnesses in the book of Revelation will have the same kind of experience as Saul. In other words, Christ will reveal himself supernaturally from heaven and convert them. Now, where is that taught in the Bible? Where do we infer that from? It's not, it's not inferred anywhere. It's not taught anywhere. This is Johnny Hagee's conjecture. I can make that statement it's just as well and say, I, I believe that the Jews will be supernaturally converted from heaven, 144,000 of them. The problem is his whole assumption is wrong, folks, and the fact that the Jews, he said, basically receive the gospel or receive the knowledge of Christ through revelation and the Gentiles receive it through propagation. In other words, the Gentiles have to have the gospel preached to them, but the Jews don't. Now, do you see the danger in that? What it does is it absolves the church of any responsibility to preach the gospel to the Jews. Because after all, if they're going to have the same kind of experience that Saul of Tarsus had, then where is the, where is the man factor in this? Who needs to preach to them? Now, the, the problem not only is his theology bad, but it also is contradictory to the Bible because all saving knowledge of Christ is through revelation, whether it's Jew or Gentile. No one knows Christ apart from revelation. Okay, now, let me show you some things here. Just, and I pointed out some scriptures. Look with me. Go to Acts chapter, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1. <coughs> we'll just go through a couple of passages and just look at some of these. And look down at, at, at Ephesians chapter 1. I remind you, Ephesians is written primarily to a Gentile church. Well, there's Jews in there, there's no doubt. The early church was a mixture of both Jew and Gentile. But when you went to certain portions of the early world, there were more Gentiles in the church than more Jews. In some places, there were more Jews than some Gentiles. That makes sense. But here in the church, uh, the church in Ephesus, there were a lot of Gentiles. Now, look at Paul's prayer. Keep in mind what Hagee just says, that the, the Gentiles receive the gospel through propagation and the Jews receive it through revelation. Now, keep, keep that in mind. In other words, the Gentiles don't need revelation. They just need propagation. Now, watch this. Verse 17, Paul is praying. He's, he basically, I do not, in verse 16, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you, who's you? The Ephesians, right? Are they Jews and Gentiles? He may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. 
In other words, you can't know Christ apart from the spirit of revelation. That's what Paul is praying. He's praying that the Ephesian church can come to a deeper knowledge of Christ through the spirit of revelation. Okay? And in so praying, he says, I'm praying, verse 18, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Notice the eyes of your heart is that enlightenment, that inner teaching, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saint, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. Again, he's praying that they may know these truths through revelation. Now, he doesn't single out the Gentiles and versus the Jews here. He's praying for the whole church. He says, you both need this spirit of revelation. Now, and further in that same letter, go to chapter 3. <clears throat> Look down, and again, he's praying. Uh, let me go back up to verse 14 and read it. Here's another prayer of his. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, and you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now what is he praying for again? He's praying again for this spirit of revelation, this knowledge of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Now, something that surpasses knowledge has to be divinely revealed. Does everybody understand that? Is that a given? Okay, so, why do we as Christians know the love of Christ? Because it's revealed to us in our hearts. Now, it's revealed to us from the Scriptures which the Holy Spirit then illuminates and allows us, as it were, to see the truth and power of those Scriptures. And that's how we come to comprehend the love of Christ. If you remember, folks, in the Old Testament, which is pretty remarkable, when you look at the tabernacle of Moses, when you went into the holy place, you got you got past the outer court and where the, where the, the uh, brazen altar and the labor were, and you went into the holy place. And you went into the holy place, on your right-hand side was a table of showbread, and on your left-hand side was the seven-branch candlestick. Or it might have been vice versa. But either way, on one side was the table of showbread, and on the other side was the candlestick. The only source of light within the holy place was the candlestick. Now, the bread, we always know that the bread, the bread Jesus tells us, I am the bread of life. If you're going to come to Christ, you need to feast on him in order to gain strength. But the only way the priest who went into the holy place could see to eat the bread was by the light of that seven lamp candlestick that was there. So the lamp shone its light on the bread, and that was allowed the priest to see what he was eating. Now, that's not there just so we can understand that GE is a good thing. You know, that's there to teach us the spiritual truth. It's there to teach us that in order to partake of the Word of God and to gain spiritual sustenance from it, we have to have the illumination of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God takes the Word of God and shines his, his light upon it and illuminates it, and that's what is called revelation. Does everybody understand that? Okay, so, apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from the Spirit of revelation, nobody understands the Word of God in a saving fashion. Now, I didn't say they can't understand it, because a lot of people who don't know God can read the Bible, they can make up, come up with some pretty good ideas from it, but they don't know it inwardly. It doesn't have a transforming power. It doesn't exert its changing influence. It doesn't conform them to its image. Okay? It hasn't affected their heart. It takes the spirit of revelation to do that. And so apart from the spirit of revelation, no one, whether he's Jew or Gentile, can know these things. Now, Hagee is basically arguing that the Jews are the recipients of this revelation. The Gentiles just get it through propagation. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. The point is, look what Jesus said back in John chapter 6. See, in other words, one of the things I've noticed, as I, as I went through this man's book, he'll, he'll make some statements that have some truth in them. And then he'll launch out in some wild conjecture and just keep moving. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute, there's a stop sign that should go up. And say, where did he get that from? Okay, now, look at John chapter 6. This is an amazing statement of Scripture. Jesus, of course, he's dealing with the Jews right here. And he's talking, and it's pretty amazing, because he's talking about this bread of life. You know, I'm the bread, and uh, you know, you've got to eat my flesh. And of course, these guys can't understand what he's saying. And, and then he goes on, look down at verse 43. 
John 6, 43, Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. Now, he doesn't say, it's not just the Jews who can come to me unless the Father draws them. It is not the Gentiles. He says, no one. Jew and Gentile. No one comes to Christ unless the Father draws. Okay? Now, this drawing process is also referred to in the next verse as something else. It is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. You see that? Now, how does the Father teach him? Does the Father miraculously appear from heaven like he did in the case of Saul of, of Saul of Tarsus and convert them all to Christ through some sort of vision? Is that what happens? Is that how you were converted to Christ? Well, of course not. How many other people do we read in the New Testament were converted to Christ that way? None. Okay, Saul the Apostle, I mean Saul of Tarsus who became Paul the Apostle, was the exception. He wasn't the rule, he was the exception. He was unique. His calling was specifically unique. All right, and the interesting thing is you cannot extrapolate and say, because this happened to Saul of Tarsus, therefore this is going to happen to all the Jews at some future date, 144,000 in the book of Revelation. That's just a wild conjecture. That's no basis in logic or in Scripture. And the point is Jesus said, look, all who come to him are taught of God. All of them. Jew and Gentile. And this teaching, what does this teaching consist of? This teaching consists of an inward revelation of our need of Christ. That's why you come to him. You don't come to Jesus until you need him. Right? So what does the Spirit do? The Spirit of God comes and convinces us. He said, Jesus said he would convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He convicts us of sin. He convinces us of our lack of righteousness. And he convinces us of a judgment. And when he does those things, and we are inwardly taught of God, we repent and come to Christ. So all of us come to Christ based on an inward revelation. Does everybody understand? Not just exclusively for the Jews. I mean, that is the... When I read this, and i got to admit, when I read this this week, I was stunned to read this. I was really stunned that somebody could make that statement in evangelical circles that there are two different ways in which people come to the knowledge of Christ between Jew and Gentile. And when I read it, it's, I thought, well, if that's the case, there is absolutely zero need to preach the gospel to these Jews because they're not going to need it anyhow. They're going to get an inward revelation like Saul of Tarsus. Well, isn't that convenient? So therefore, you can be among the Jews, you can be among the nation of Israel, you can find favor with it because you don't preach the gospel to them. There's no offense. Hey, we're all just one happy family. Boy, that's sad that Paul didn't know that because you know what? When you look at Paul in the New Testament, the book of Acts, what was his, his modus operandi? He always went to the synagogues and what did he do? Preach to the Jews. He always did. And you know what he did when he preached? He reasoned with them. He opened the scriptures and he reasoned. He, I mean, you go through, I was looking through his, 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 uh, his sermons in Acts 13. is a great sermon. He goes into a synagogue and he just takes them all the way back, just like Stephen the martyr did. He takes them all the way back to their beginning. And then he shows them the promise. And then he shows them what happened with Moses. And he shows them the, how God fulfilled the promise through Christ. And I mean, he's just going right through Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. And he says, oh, this prophecy is fulfilled. This promise is fulfilled. And now, here, Christ has come. Jesus of Nazareth, he is your Messiah. And he says, repent and believe on him. And he's expostulating, he's reasoning, he's trying to reach their mind. He's not sitting back and saying, okay, God, uh, give him some special vision and presto change him. He's laboring to convince them. Okay? Now, let me show you something. And when the last time we see the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, guess what? He's doing this, still doing the same thing. Look at Acts 28. Go over there. Acts chapter 28. The very last time we see him. Okay, now you remember, he's, been a, he's basically a prisoner. Everybody knows he's here in Rome, and he's chained to a Roman soldier while he's doing this. It's pretty amazing. I mean, that Roman soldier got some great Bible studies, didn't he? <laughs> wow. You know? So, I mean, I just can't imagine that. This guy chained to a Roman soldier. You know, how that must have been like. You know, I mean, Paul, you just you feel for Paul what he went through. 
And yet the same token, God no doubt used it. There's no way in my mind that some of these guys who heard him preach could not have been affected. You know, I'm sure some of them, I hope, would like to think some of those Roman soldiers got converted. But either way, I don't know. That's just a guess. That's my conjecture for what it's worth. But I can't prove it. I can't disprove it. But I can't disprove something Johnny Hagee says. Okay, now here's the point in Acts 28. Here's Paul. Now, here, okay, look at verse... Acts 28, go down to verse 19. Okay? He's got some Jews. Well, back up so you can see. Verse 17. It happened that after three days he called together those who were the leading men of the Jews. And when they had come together, he began saying to them, Brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. So who is he speaking to here? The Jews. The leading Jews. So he's got the, like, the Jewish leaders in the city of Rome have come to Paul. Okay? And he says in verse 19, but When the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any accusation against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I am requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. And they said to him, We have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren come here and reported or spoken anything bad about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are for concerning this sect it is known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. And when they had set a day for him, they came to him and his lodging in large numbers. Now watch. Watch what his standard, his modus operandi was. What did he do? He was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. Some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others would not believe. Now, notice some were persuaded. Does everybody see that? That doesn't say anything about them having some sort of divine revelation like Saul had gotten. It said they were persuaded by the things that Paul spoke. The same way the Gentiles are persuaded. When the gospel is, is preached, it's preached to appeal to men's minds. Okay? And the Holy Spirit comes in and illuminates that. The, the, the gospel addresses men's mind, men's ability to reason, men's ability to think and comprehend. It says, comprehend, I am a sinner. I have sinned against God. I need a righteousness that will save me from His judgment. Christ has provided that righteousness, therefore I will embrace it. And an informed decision then makes, you know, I mean, an informed conscience makes a decision and embraces Christ. Just like the Jews did. The way to preach the gospel to the Jews is not to just sit back and expect God to appear supernaturally from heaven. It's to preach to them. It's to explain scriptures. It's to show that their Messiah that was prophesied is none other than Jesus of Nazareth. He's the one that God promised. He's the one who is their Redeemer. He's the one who fulfills the promise made to Abraham. That's what Paul did. But according to Hagee, you don't have to worry about that because the Gentiles and the Jews come to a knowledge of Christ in a different manner. You know, in Romans chapter 10 says, how are they going to hear unless the preacher's sent? you got to preach to them. It's remarkable to me that somebody would issue a statement like this here in a book which anybody in the world could read and nobody would refute that. It's silly. Now, let's go on to say some other things as well. This is what's remarkable. I'm going to turn to different pages here. And I hope this is uh, informative to you. But why, why this amazes me is, as I said last week, over 700,000 copies of this book have been sold. And I guarantee you they weren't sold so people could critique them. You know, there are probably very few of them among that number where somebody bought it actually critique it. You know, and I, as I was going through this, I thought, this is really sad because he'll make some good statements and then he'll run off with some outlandish opinions that have no relevance to the topic at hand or a complete juxtaposition of Scripture and he just keeps on going. And then anybody who dis disagrees with that, he just labels them as anti-Semitic. Well, that's convenient. Now, here's where it really gets interesting. This is, this is fascinating and there's a lot, lot here. But, well, let me tell you, I'll read it to you. I'll go here and show you the actual quote. And y'all can bear with me because I'm turning to these things as well. He goes on, has God rejected Israel? This is the name of the title, the chapter. God rejected Israel. And you can see my little scribbles marks on here. And here's what he says. This starts the chapter. 
The concept of replacement theology is popular in America's churches. Replacement theology means that Israel failed, God has replaced Israel with the church. This is simply not true. That's his statement. First off, I don't know of anybody who advocates the scriptural position of Israel as the church replacing Israel. Nobody I know who holds the view that the Israel of the New Testament is Jew and Gentile ever uses the word replacement. I've never used it. I've held that view for years. I've never heard any of the guys that I know of who advocate this using it either. It's what the dispensationalists coined to cast contempt on the view. What the position of those of us who reject dispensationalism is that God has always had one chosen people. One. One olive tree. One people. One new man. And those are composed of the true descendants of Abraham. In the Old Testament, they were primarily drawn from the Jewish nation. In the New Testament, they're primarily drawn from Gentiles. But they're a mixture of Jew and Gentile. There's always been one chosen people. And those are the true seed of Abraham. And we've never said the term replacement. What we have said is that Israel as a nation has ceased in its purpose for God. It's no longer needed. That's what we say. And that Israel as a nation, the theocracy was a scaffold upon which God brought forth the Messiah. And once the scaffolding, once the building is completed, there's no need for the scaffolding. That's what we say. Now, so he goes on, and this is what's amazing. So he says it's simply not true. And then here's his quote. I say then, Romans 11 verse 1. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Now that's Paul's statement. Now here's his inference. Ready? Twice in Romans 11, Paul says that Israel has not fallen and is still the apple of God's eye. He doesn't say that in Romans 11. No, I mean, I looked and I pulled out the Greek and I pulled everything out and I went through Romans 11 inside and out and not once could I find the phrase, Israel is still the apple of my eye. It's not there. Now, hey, he put it there. Hey, he says, this is what Paul the Apostle said. No, he did not say that. He never said, Israel was the apple of God's eye. And the way Hagee's using the term Israel is not the way Paul's using the term Israel. We covered that last week. But what's amazing is this. And let me just read you this. He goes on and says, uh, has God cast away Israel? Absolutely not. The fact is, when something is cast away, you never hear of it again. Yet, in the book of Revelation, 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes, are sealed to present the gospel during the Great Tribulation. Let me remind you that during the Great Tribulation, the Gentile church is in heaven. The 144,000 who will be sealed to present the gospel to the world will be 144 Jewish people who have a supernatural revelation of the identity of Jesus Christ as Messiah, similar to Paul's revelation on the road to Damascus. The point here is that a nation called Israel is alive and well during the Tribulation. Now, look at his, his assumption again. He assumes that God hasn't cast away the nation of Israel simply because his view of the book of Revelation says, oh, those Jews that are mentioned there have to be literal Jews and there has to be a literal nation of Israel. So therefore, the, the nation of Israel must still exist. So those of us who would say, whether it's an on-mill view or a post-mill view or a pre-mill view or a preterist view, there are some people among those various views who look at the book of Revelation and say the book is written in symbols. And 144,000 are a symbol. They're not literal. And even if those who would say, no, 144,000 are literal, some people would say, but that occurred previously. That was in 70, prior to 70 AD. So they're all different interpretations of the book of Revelation. So his assumption is the premillennial dispensational view is the only correct view of the book of Revelation, and there's Jews there, therefore God has not cast away the nation of Israel. That is not even following Paul's argument. He's not following Paul's argument. He's following his own argument. He's saying, oh, the book book of Revelation says there's Jews. Therefore, God hadn't cast away the Jews. Now, here's what's amazing. So there's a statement, and he says this. The only way anyone can confuse the obvious meaning of Scripture is to spiritualize the text with an allegorical meaning rather than factual meaning. That's why Scripture must be interpreted by other Scriptures. 
paying close attention to whom it is written and for that purpose. Now, lest it become twisted and distorted by theological demagogues leading to confusion and deception. So in other words, now notice this. I'm not attacking this man's character. I'm not attacking his motives. I'm not attacking his sincerity. I'm attacking his view. But yet anybody who attacks his view is labeled a theological demagogue. So we're all demagogues in here. Now, you know what a demagogue is? A demagogue is a person who stirs up rabble, who stirs up riot and trouble, playing on people's fears and prejudices. Okay? That's what a demagogue does. A demagogue, and you'll see it here even in the public arena in the United States, you'll see people, whenever there's some sort of incident, and typically it's a racial incident, you'll always see somebody down there to flame the racial tensions. The demagogues, they play on racial prejudice, racial tensions, fears, bigotry, they play on that. So what he's saying is that those who differ from his view of this book are demagogues that play on the fears and prejudice of others. In other words, he's saying they're anti-Semitic. In other words, they just hate Jews. So anybody who hates Jews, there are always people out there who can play on those fears and those hatred, those prejudices, and stir them up because we differ from this foolishness. Now here's what his point is. This is what's remarkable. I'll come to this in a minute. He goes on, to, and his proof for all this is very, very quite unique. He says, two pictures of Abraham's seed that clearly reflect the difference between Israel and the church can be found in Scripture. Okay, he says clearly. I say quite muddily. Okay, now watch. The first picture of Abraham's seed presents Abraham's descendants as the sand of the sea. Okay, so that's Genesis 22:17. 17. So everybody turn there. Let's look at it. Okay, let's, let's examine what he says. Okay, Genesis 22:17. 17. And the reason I'm doing this, folks, again, is not so I just pick on Hagee. I'm no threat to him. This church is no threat to him. My point is that there are three quarters of a million people who believe this. Minimum. They bought his book. That's a lot of people. Genesis 22. Now here's, here's what, he, what he quotes from. Look at verse 17. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemy. So here's what he says. The first picture of Abraham's seed presents Abraham's descendant as the sand of the sea. Okay, and he says this, sand is earthy. Its volume represents the multitude of people from Abraham's seed, both Jews and Arabs. So the sand of the sea is what he says is the physical descendants of Abraham. That's what he says, Jews and Arabs. Okay, y'all know Arabs why? Because Ishmael, remember? Okay, so, so in other words, when God said, Abraham will multiply your descendants as the sand of the seashore, he's talking about Abraham's physical descendants. And then he goes on to say, the second picture of Abraham's seed found in the same scripture is the stars of the heavens. And we just read it. The stars of the heavens represent the church. The features of the stars are, the stars produce light, the church is commanded to be the light of the world. The stars rule over the night just as the church is commanded to rule over powers and principalities of darkness. The church rules in heavenly places, which is reflected in Ephesians 6, is the role of the church. God gave the Jewish people a physical land whose literal boundaries are given in Genesis 15, 18 through 21. It's a specific land with Jerusalem as its capital city forever. The church has been given a heavenly kingdom, just as Christ promised in my Father's house, heaven, are many mansions. I will come again and receive you to myself, and where I am with the Father in heaven, there you may also be. John 14. So in other words, according to Mr. Hagee, the sand of the seashore refers only to Abraham's physical descendants. The stars of the heaven refers to the church. Everybody understand that? Right? So he, he's made an arbitrary division now. He just says, according to Johnny Hagee, and offer any proof of this, he just asserts it. He just makes a statement and says, the sand is earthy, therefore it refers to his physical descendants, and the stars of the heaven are heavenly, therefore that refers to the church. Now, here's the interesting thing. Scripture contra completely contradicts him. Okay, go to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Remember, stars of the heaven are the church, according to John Hayes. Is that right? Is that what he, we just read that. Is that what he just said? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not, I mean, again, I'm reading his book honestly. I'm just going right through it and reading it. I'm not adding or taking away from just reading it. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 10. 
Now, God, this is Moses. He's speaking to the people. They're on the verge of the promised land here. And Moses obviously failed to get the word from Mr. Hagee. Because in verse 9, he says, I spoke to you at that time saying, I am not able to bear the burden of you alone. The Lord your God has multiplied you. Behold, you are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. Now, Mr. Hagee has just told us on page 166 of his book that the stars of heaven refer to the church. Here it is on his book. According to Moses, the stars of heaven refer to the Israelites. Physical descendants of Abraham. Nothing to do with the church. Okay? That's not a let's use Mr. Hagee's principle in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So let's go look at some more scripture. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Again, who is this written to? Is the so-called church here in existence according to the way we think of the term church? No, this is the Israelites. This is the Jews. Alright? Verse 22, Hebrews, oh, excuse me, Deuteronomy 10. Your fathers went down to Egypt 70 persons in all. Now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. Whoops! How'd that get in there? There they are again. There's the Israelites, physical descendants, Jews, <coughs> referred to as the stars of heaven for their sheer numbers. Here's another one. Go to Deuteronomy 28. Look down toward the end of this chapter. Okay, you ready? Verse 62. Well, let's back up to 61 so you get the essence of it. Also, every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of the law, the Lord will bring on you until you are destroyed. Then you shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because you did not obey the Lord your God. Notice that. So once again, we got three references. And guess what, folks? There's more than three. I'm not going to show you every reference in the Old Testament. There's more than three referring to the stars of the heavens as the Jews. Now, here, here, look, here's what we have. We have a clear, expressed contradiction from what's written in this book I'm holding by Mr. Hagee and his assertion and what the Bible says. He's made an assertion unfounded by fact, unfounded or unsubstantiated by any scripture, that says Abraham basically has two seed. One physical, one spiritual. And that the physical seed are the sands of the seashore and the spiritual seed are the stars of the heavens. Wrong. Abraham has one seed and God said it's referred to as sand of the seashore. It's the stars of heaven. Everybody see it? Everybody got that? And the seed, namely the physical Jews of his day, were multiplied as the stars of the heaven. In other words, God was just saying there are going to be so many you can't count them. He's not making a distinction between a heavenly and an earthly people. He's just telling Abraham, you don't have any children right now, but I'm going to bless you and you're going to be the father of a great multitude and there'll be so many you can't count them. That's all he's saying to him. He's not building a theological concept around it. So the point is, I mean, this is a false inference. And he makes a statement in this book. He says, the stars have their purpose and the sand has its purpose. And I thought to myself, well, the stars I can understand, they shine. And he even wrote that down here, which is good, the stars shine. Well, what purpose does the sand have? I don't know. You can make sand castles out of it, but what do you do with it? What's its purpose? It doesn't state. I don't know. It's just a figure of speech and expression that he just used. So here we go again. I mean, in other words, he will utter things in his book that are completely unsubstantiated and are an express violation of Scripture, and yet nobody calls him on it. And yet he has the temerity to suggest that those who do call him and who do disagree as demagogic anti-Semites. Wow, that's amazing. You just inoculate yourself from anybody even examining what you're teaching. You set yourself up on a pedestal so you can't question my teaching because if you do, you're just a Jew hater. That's amazing to me. And you realize, folks, how many people accept this as truth? Now, I've only covered two portions of this. I mean, there are, 
What really bothered me, and there's even more than this, is this whole concept of election. Now let me show you something. Go, go, go to Romans 9, get there, and I'm going to read to you some pages. Okay? I'll turn to Romans 9, and here's what gets interesting to me. This is, i got to get over to Romans 9. All right, here's a statement. Now, we can argue, people can argue election back and forth, Arminian Calvinism. I touched on some things that were blatantly obvious. You know, it, it's, it's, there's no problem, it, it, I should think, from people examining this with an open mind, seeing that Mr. Hagee's assertions are flat out wrong. But, when you get to Romans 9, there can be an honest difference of opinion there about the, the views of election. Okay? Arminians, let me just say this to you, we're Calvinistic in this church. Uh, and we're very proud of being reformed the doctrine of the church because we believe that's the correct doctrine. However, Arminians have a different view of election. But I will say this. There is not a single Arminian that I know who espouses the same teaching about election that Johnny Hagee is going to set forth in his book. Okay? Now, Arminians teach the following. They teach that God, in his foreknowledge, looks across and surveys the human race you know, from the vantage point of eternity past, and sees those whom, when confronted with the claims of the gospel, will receive that gospel, will respond, will repent, and confess, and accept Christ. And on that basis of their free will choice, the you Armenians know, say God elects or chooses them. Okay, now, we can disagree with that, which I do. Okay, we believe as Calvinists that God looks down the corridors of time, and so nobody would believe unless His grace enabled them to do so. And based on no merit or no free will choice of theirs, graciously elects some to life and passes over others. Okay, now, you can argue that. But no Arminian says that election is confined to the Jews. Arminians will say election is confined to individuals. Okay? Individuals that God looked down the quarters of time and saw would have faith and chose them on that basis. Okay? That's not what Hagee asserts. This is pretty remarkable. Now, let me read it to you. Page one, let me get to here in this book. It's on page, uh, oh, first off, I'll read, this is page 140, 145. He says, first, it is obvious that divine election is taught in Scripture. See Romans 9. Very good. But here's the statement after that. The question is, to whom is divine election offered? In my opinion, divine election is offered only to the nation of Israel. Now, first off, leave aside the issue of Israel. <clears throat> election, by its very definition, is not offered to anybody. Election is the choice of God. You don't offer a choice. In other words, God, according to the Armenians, looked down the corridors of time and saw those who would believe and chose or elected them. He didn't offer to choose them. He chose them in eternity past, is what the Arminians say, based on their free will decision. The Calvinists say God chose or elected them based on his own free will, God's free will, God's gratuitous choice of them. But it's not offered to them. It was a choice that God made. So the very words he's using implies he doesn't understand the doctrine. Election is not offered to anyone. It's a divine choice. Okay? How do I offer to choose someone? Okay, now, here's the point. So let's, let's, get, let's move past that. Now, he goes on to say this. Uh, let me read page 147. Well, I'll read it to you. He says, If divine election is true for Gentiles, as some major denominations search, why go to church? Why witness? Why evangelize? Well, I could ask you the same question, Mr. Hagee, about why should we evangelize to the Jews if they're going to receive a divine revelation? You answer that question for us, and we'll answer yours. So here's the point. If God has already determined who is going to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell, why pray? Why read the Bible? See, again, no understanding of the doctrine of election. The man has never taken the time to get acquainted with Reformed theology to understand that nobody who holds the doctrine of election in Reformed circles teaches or believes this. We believe that because there is an election by God, it is an imperative that the gospel be preached, and it is an imperative that men pray. Why is that? Because those are the means whereby God uses to bring his elect to himself. And we've already taught on that in this church many times about how predestination in terms of election does not imply that men do not preach the gospel. Paul 
who wrote Romans 9, who was a believer in election, and we'll get into those specifics, Peter, who talked about election, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, all of them preached the gospel. Okay, so you preach the gospel. Okay, now, so let's move beyond that. He goes on, if divine election is true, how can you say God is love? Same old objection the Arminians always bring. How can the Holy Spirit write in John 13 that God so loved the world if he's still going to send most of you to an everlasting hell? Again, does not understand the doctrine, hasn't got acquainted with it. But let's move past that. He says this, divine election is the fact for some of the Jewish people who are a remnant according to the election of grace. Divine election simply is not for Gentiles. Now that's his statement. Here it is. I'm not making it up. Right there on page 147, top of the page, divine election is not so for Gentiles. So elect, Gentiles don't get elected somehow. Now whatever that means. The problem is, again, he has a problem with the Apostle Paul. Okay, let's go to Romans 9. Let's read it. So in other words, divine election according to Mr. Hayes is only for the Jewish people. And apply to Gentiles. Now look at this. Here's Paul. Now, without getting too much into this passage, because we could get lost in the whole theory on the theory, not theory, on the teaching of, of election and predestination. But I want you to notice that when we talk about election, we're talking about God choosing some and passing over others. Okay? That's the very term. If I if there's twenty apples in front of me and I choose ten to bring them to myself, if by act of choosing ten, I've left ten behind. Okay? I haven't done any evil to those ten, I just haven't chosen them. And left them in the same state I found them. Okay? Now Paul is arguing about this election, and he goes on to say, let's just take a look at it. Uh, verse 14, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, as there may it never be. And he's answering that according to Jacob, whom I love, Esau, whom I hate. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or on the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. It can be any clearer than that. You know, what muddies the waters is men won't accept what Paul says. They don't, like, they don't like the doctrine, so they object to what he says. Now, the point is, Paul is saying, it doesn't depend on man, it depends on God's choice. Okay? In other words, there's no effort of the flesh that's involved here. The man who wills, the man who runs. There's nothing to do with it. It's God's choice. And God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Now, that shows the divine prerogative to pardon some and to pass over others. Now, why this is a strange concept for people to grasp, I never will comprehend. When you look at the very nation of Israel's history in, in Israel alone, I mean, those who reject the doctrine of election of individuals, it amazes me because when you go back and look into the Bible, you see God raised up this group of people, the Jews, the Jewish nation, Abraham, and he left all these other nations in darkness. They never even heard the gospel, never even heard the word Jehovah, never heard the word Messiah, they never knew who Abraham was. The Mayans, the Incas, the, the just name them, the, the Chinese, the Australians, just name them. Pick your spot on the globe. Never heard the gospel, never heard anything about Christ. Psalm 147, God made known his word to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation. No other nation knew these things. There was the election right there. God passes over a whole group of people. So, didn't God love them? According to the Arminian, he had to give them some sort of chance, but he didn't. But that's the point. The point is, Paul's talking about that mercy is one that's free from God. God's under no obligation to pardon. When a, when a convicted sinner goes into the court of law and approaches the bench, he doesn't say to the judge, I demand you have mercy on me. Does he? What does he do? He pleads for mercy. Why? Because he knows the court doesn't have to give it. Well, that's the analogy here. Men are guilty. See, this, the, the people who have pro with election assume that men are innocent. They're not innocent. We're all guilty. And so God freely pardons them. Now, Paul's arguing this thing, and he goes back and forth, and he uses Pharaoh. For this scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name I proclaim throughout the whole earth. So he has mercy on whom he wills, and he hardens whom he wills. There's Pharaoh. There's a Gentile. God says, I raise you up for one reason, that I'm going to demonstrate my power. Okay, now, you will say to him, why then does he still find fault for who resists his will? 
If you understand what Paul is saying, that is exactly the question you would ask. You would never have that question asked if you are an Arminian. Your doctrine will never, ever elicit this question. A Calvinist says this, God has mercy on whom he wills and pardons whom he wills. He pardons some, he passes over others. And then men say, that's not fair. That's what Paul is responding to. The Arminian says, oh, God gives everyone a chance to believe the gospel. And if they reject it on their own free will, then he sends all those who reject to hell. Well, that sounds fair. They've had a chance. Right? Isn't that what the way our mind thinks? But notice, if you were an Arminian, that's what you would say. But because that's not what Paul is saying, the response that Paul anticipates, well, who resists his will? Why does he find fault? Because that's, if you properly understand what Paul is saying, that's going to be your response. And Paul then says, basically, well, who are you, old man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? Now, do you see the analogy between the potter and the clay? Right? So, let's follow this. The potter takes a lump of clay and he can make some for honorable use and some for common use. Okay, now, does everybody understand that the ones made for honorable use are those who are elect and those who are for common use have been passed over? Everybody got that? Right? Now, let's keep the analogy because now Paul is going to define these terms a little bit further. What if, verse 22, God, willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endure with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? All right, so let's stop. He introduces another term, vessels of wrath. Everybody sees that term? Now, bring that term back to the clay. Are the vessels of wrath synonymous with the clay that's made for common use? Yes? Does everybody see the connection? Are we straining this at all? No. Okay. Paul says the vessels of wrath are those that are the clay that are made for common use. And he says, okay, what about that? Verse 23, he did so in order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of what? Mercy. So you got two vessels here. Vessels of wrath, vessels of mercy. Vessels of wrath is the clay made for common use. Vessels of mercy is the clay made for honorable use. Vessels of mercy is the clay made for honorable use are the same as those whom God pardons, those whom God chooses to pardon. Vessels of wrath, clay made for common use, are the same as God passes over and hardens. Does everybody see that? Okay, so you've got the term. So you're, right now, watch this. Paul says, there is the, in other words, so could you say the vessels of mercy are the elect? Is that a strain? No. The vessels of mercy are the recipients of God's election. Is that understandable here? Now watch. He did this, or he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Watch this expression. Even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but from among the Gentiles. So are Gentiles recipients of election? Yes or no? Yes. Are they vessels of mercy? Yes. How do we know that? Paul just said it. Johnny Hagee. Divine election is not so for the Gentiles. Page 147. The Apostle Paul just said, the Gentiles and the Jews, those of us whom he called, not only Jews, but also Gentiles, were vessels of mercy. We're clay made for honorable use. We've received the election. Does everybody understand? you understand what this man just said in this book is completely and patently false? We don't have to just say it's false. We can prove it's false. He just made a statement that has no conviction or no way to, pay, uh, to back it up in Scripture. He just said divine election is not for the Gentile. Paul just said it is. He just said that's why we're here, because God called us, not just from among the Jews, but from among the Gentiles. In order to substantiate his position, he quotes further from the prophet Hosea. Look at this. He Paul doesn't even just, look, Hagee doesn't offer us any proof, and he's not an apostle. Paul offers us the proof, and he's an apostle, and then substantiates it. Now watch this. He goes and says, how do I know this? Verse 25. As he says in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people. 
and her who is not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people there, they shall be called sons of the living God. So what is he saying? Those who were not called my people. Were the Gentiles ever called the people of God in the Old Testament? Of course not. Okay? So Paul is saying, Hosea predicted a day in which God would have a people for himself among the Gentiles. And he substantiates that by quoting from the prophet Hosea. And he says, these people who have been called out from among the Gentiles are the recipients of God's divine election. Just like some of the Jews who will be called out from among the mass of Jews are also the recipients of divine election. Election here is Jew and Gentile. God gathering to himself one people out of two different groups of people. Jew and Gentile. God gathering together himself a group of people, calling them, justifying them, and eventually glorifying them, as Romans 8 says, so that he has a people. Hagee says divine election is all about the Jews, not about the Gentiles. <laughs> Doesn't even apply to the Gentiles. Absolutely astounding that somebody with an audience that large, with a church that large, with, like I said, almost three quarters of a million books sold, could make a statement like that and simply go unchallenged on it. Even if you're not a Calvinist, you can see this is not true. Even Arminian, who's, who's, who doesn't really care about Calvinistic viewpoint, can read this text and say, God chose Jew and Gentile and elected them on the basis of foreseen faith. That's what Arminian would say. He even wouldn't go as far as Hagee went. That's astounding to me. Now, we could go more. There's more to this, but Ephesians chapter 1 is another one. Let me show you this. We're going to run out of time, so let's go to Ephesians 1. Let's look at this passage. And look how Paul starts this letter. He goes, uh, verse 3, Blessed, if I got verse chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, even as he chose the Jews. Even as he chose, what does it say there? Us. Who's he writing to? Ephesians. Ephesians are primarily Gentile. There are Jews mixed in here as well. So he's not limiting the election to Jews. He's saying Jew and Gentile. He said he chose you when he did this in Christ before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Not according to foreseen faith. Not according to any foreseen choice. But according to the kind intention of his will. That's what grace is all about. Anybody see that? Here, he's not limiting this to Gent Jews. He's saying the church. He says, you church, Jew, Gentile, you're recipients of divine election. God made a choice of you in eternity past in Christ. Predestinated you to the adoption of his sons according to the kind intention of his will. And now here's, here's more proof that he offers us. And we're going to close. He says, in the Latin nation, this is on page 150. This is toward the end of that. He says, the Bible speaks of Israel as an elect nation. And he gives a quote. But then he goes on to say, when giving his prophecy to the twelve disciples on the crest of the Mount of Olives, Jesus said, Unless those days were shortened, the days of the Great Tribulation, no flesh would be saved but for the elect's sake. And here's where Hagee inserts this. The Jewish people. Those days will be shortened. Matthew 24, 22, emphasis added. You might want to also read uh, comments inserted by Hagee. Okay, because... He takes the liberty of saying that the elect are the Jewish people. He just writes it into the text. I mean, he writes it here. I didn't make it up. There it is. The Jewish people. Now, how does he know this? Well, for those who believe the elect in this verse are Christians, please understand that during the Great Tribulations, Christians will already be in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Case closed. Problem solved. Settled. Beyond dispute. So, in other words... Because dispensational theology we know is absolutely 100% correct and all the Christians will have been raptured and they're in heaven already, the only people that Jesus could be referring to when he used the term elect must be the Jewish people because Matthew 24 no doubt refers to the end of the world. That's his assumption. There are those of us who would differ with that view. Because first off, we rejected the idea that there is a great tribulation in which Christians are sitting in heaven eating dinner while the rest of the world is getting cream down here. Okay? We reject that view. 
And we reject the view that Matthew 24 is dealing with the end of the world events as we know it. We believe the events of Matthew 24 are dealing with the end of the Jewish age because the end of the world, the word world, cosmos, is not there. The word is aeon, A-E-O-N in the Greek, which means time or age. The disciples never asked Jesus, when is the end of the world? They asked him when the end of the age is. And what were the signs of his coming and basically how they were going to know those things. So they asked when the end of the age, not the world. It's unfortunate that the King James used the word world and that's distorted a lot of theological systems ever since. But the point is, Hagee's proof that the election is only for the Jewish people is based out of Matthew 24 in which he just says the elect have to be the Jews because the Christians are all in heaven, so therefore by default the elect have to be Jews, which means only the Jews get election, the Gentiles don't. That's his proof. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Now, the point is, this book, and I've got to close here because I have a lot more to go through with this book. This book really bothered me when I read it. Again, because of the claims that were made in this book and the way it was written. To just dismiss anybody who disagrees with him. Look, there are people where I'm a preterist. I was an amillennialist before that. Even as an amillennialist, I didn't believe this, that Hagee wrote. And there are people who are amillennialist. There are people who are postmillennial. There are people who are preterist who reject his view that he espouses. That doesn't mean we're anti-Semitic. Matter of fact, I've got to ask the question then too, you know, in his sarcastic way, well, if you really believe in the election, then why bother preaching? Why bother praying? Why bother teaching the you know, gospel to anybody? I've got to ask him that same question. Well, if you really believe this about the Jews, then there's no sense in even preaching to them. We don't need to preach to them. We don't need to call them now to believe in their Messiah. We don't need to call them now to repent. We don't need to tell them now that the promises of Abraham have been fulfilled. All the promises of Abraham have been fulfilled in Christ. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, obviously was really confused because he said, basically, God made these promises to Abraham and he fulfilled them by raising up his servant, namely Jesus, to turn every one of you from your sins. Peter was urging them to be saved pleading with them. And if you think about it, in the early church, the early church was made up originally of all Jews. And how do we know that? Because that's who the apostles preached to. And then they went out to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. They didn't stand around and say, we don't have to worry because they're going to get some divine revelation. 144,000 are going to get Jesus appearing to them just like the apostle Paul did. And they're going to be converted. And they're going to turn the world upside down and evangelize because the church has failed. And we've got to leave it up to these super 444,000 to do what the church couldn't do. We don't have to, you know, in other words, we don't believe that. I don't believe that because I don't believe that makes us an anti-Semitic group. That's bizarre. So the point I'm saying in this is if you go through this book and as we hold it up to the light of Scripture, we'll really see there's a lot of errors in here. You know, the one thing that he makes a statement, and, and I found this remarkable, and, and uh, I'll get into this more next week. The, the, I mean, the, man, the man's got a bias in favor of Israel that literally clouds his ability to see the Scriptures clearly. Mm-hmm. He simply can't see it. Now, what he says, and the reason being, he's convinced himself of his view. Now, the problem that he's got is he makes a statement here in this book, and I'll get to it next week, that the reason the book of Romans was written was for Paul to teach the people at Rome God's plan and purpose for the Jewish nation. That's the reason the book of Romans was written. You know, I don't like to use this word, but that shows a stunning ignorance of the book of Romans. The book of Romans was to teach us the nature of justification. How does God justify an unjust man? How does God pardon? On what basis are sinners accepted before God? That's why Romans was written. To teach us those truths. And Paul uses Abraham. And he uses David as an example that these guys were looking for pardon from their sins, not by works of the law, but by righteousness that would be imputed to them. Blessed is the man to whom thou does not impute sin, David says in Romans chapter 4, Paul's quoting. The whole thing about the, the, whole thing, thing about the book of, of Romans is not about the Jews, it's about justification. The Jewish thing, the issue with the Jews is a footnote. Paul raises it in order to answer the question of some of those who are asking, well, what about the Jews who have the law, basically? What do they stand? How come some of them have been rejected? And he's going to deal with that. Because in the church of Rome, there were Jews there as well. 
not only were there Jews, there were Gentiles. So it's sort of a footnote that's added there. But he didn't write the book of Romans for that reason. I mean, once you start reading scripture in that light, you can't see it. And it's a tragic to me because I really, this thing really bothers me because I see more and more people accept this kind of teaching and there's no critical evaluation of it. It's just assumed that it's true. And woe to those who challenge it. You know, I always thought, and, and I read in Zechariah chapter 8, it said Jerusalem will be called the city of truth. That's what it would be called, the city of truth. And I always thought as a Christian, and I'll tell you what, I, my naivety was, has left me a long time ago. But I always thought as a young Christian, especially as a guy who wanted to teach the Word of God, that all you had to do was take the truth and show it to people who were Christians, and they would really love it. They would say, wow, I see it. And they would embrace it, and they would cherish it, and they would be grateful for it. And the older I get, the longer I live, the more I teach, the more I realize, the majority of them simply don't want it. Anything that requires effort to think, to analyze, to weigh, to critically evaluate, it's rejected. It's just assumed that whatever somebody says who has a reputation and, and has been accepted for the longest time is true, and what will be to those who challenge it? And it's amazing to me, because the mentality in the church today, and I'm going to say this as respectfully as I know how, is no different than the mentality that existed in the world during the days in which men thought the, the earth was flat. Anybody who questioned the fact that the earth was flat was viewed as a heretic of his day. It was just assumed. It had to be true. We believed it for a thousand years. You sail to a certain point and you fall off. And if you look at the ancient maps of those days, they had uh, a picture of the seas. At the end of the seas, on those flat maps, there were these huge monsters that were on the edge of the sea. Because you kept going, boy, you went too far. And off the end of the earth you went, and down you went into the mouth of some big monster. But you know, folks believed that for thousands of years. And then one day a guy came along and said, you know what, the earth's not flat, it's round. And he says, I can prove it. And they nailed him basically to a cross, figuratively speaking, because he was a heretic. And it's the same mentality in the church today. Narrow-minded, intolerant, bigoted Christians who simply will not examine the doctrine that they hold as truth and hold it to the light of Scripture objectively. Objectively. In other words, let's go to the Word of God and let's look and see if this is true. You just can't find it. And i got to tell you, as a pastor, it's incredibly disheartening to see it. it, 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 it you, you say, God, is there, people in this, is there people in this country who will actually study out these things? And there are, thank God, but they're few and far between, it seems. You know, somebody writes a book. It says... Jerusalem countdown, weighed in the balances. How many do you think will sell? A hundred? You can even get a major publisher to carry it. You know, we could go to whoever this publisher is, front line, and say, I have a rebuttal to this book. I'd like to publish it. How many do you think will publish it? That's why all the preterist sites you know, have had to start to own publishing companies. Because nobody will publish their works. But the point is, you're going to offer a scriptural examination of something, then, you know, Somebody ought to be able to put it out there. My view is, look, if you're going to teach in the public arena, you need to be able to have your teaching subjected to public scrutiny. It's just that simple. And if, if the way you're going to deal with your critics is by dismissing them as anti-Semitic de demagogues and narcissistic preachers, then you've got a problem of insecurity because your view is not going to hold up upon examination of Scripture. You've got to discredit those who are going to come against it. And that's what this man does. Okay? And it's, 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 it's sad very sad to me. But anyhow, let's close in prayer and we'll look at this uh, next week. There was a lot more. We haven't touched the surface on this thing, but uh, we'll get into some more. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because the book really isn't, you know, once you see past some of this, you realize where you're going, but I just want to deal with some of the highlights in here and uh, then we'll wrap that up. Let's close. Father, thank you for your word. We ask you to bless what we've heard today. And Lord, we just pray that you help us understand the things that are written in the word of God. Lord, we, our biggest concern, Lord, is that we we get lifted up in pride and arrogance and we forget, Lord, what you've taught us, what you've shown us, where many of us come from ourselves, some of the things we once believed. Lord, help us to stay small, humble, teachable in our own eyes. Don't allow us, Lord, to make the mistake or make the assumption that somehow that we are above error, we are above criticism, we are above correction or reproof or even rebuke if necessary. But Lord, we would pray that we would be humble people and we would love the truth of your word above everything else. 
Even if it clashes with some of our dearly held beliefs, Lord, help us to be able to examine these things with an open heart and open mind. And, Lord, I just ask you, I pray for some of these people who are exposed to this teaching. And, Lord, if so many of these things have been discredited in the past, so many of these predictions made by men in this doctrine, this system have been already thoroughly discredited, and yet people keep believing these things and keep buying them and keep paying money for them and whatever, Lord, I just pray some of the people who sent out these teachings would have their eyes open to understand what's being taught and how unscriptural the view is and how far off the view is.